Amen. God is good, isn't he? All the time. When um, I came to this part in 1 Peter, I've got to admit, I, I wasn't that keen on preaching it because it's not an easy passage to preach and it's not a um, come to Jesus and everything will be rosy kind of passage, which is kind of what we used to in this country, isn't it? Yet again, we've taken on some of the stuff from America that we perhaps should have been a bit more careful about. Because today, and, but as we've worshipped, I've got to say, I've just become more and more convinced it was, it's the right thing. And, um, and I, again, at the end, I just want to challenge us with what God has already spoken to us today, that God wants us to get really serious about him and get passionate about him. So as we work through this, I'm talking about suffering for being a Christian this morning. It's all the way through the New Testament. Because we, we tend so often now, a lot of us, to use little read, daily reading notes, and we don't read through scripture, we, we miss out on a load of stuff we should be hearing about and reading about, folks. Can I encourage you today to read through your Bible and to go through everything because God has an awful lot to say. The Bible has an awful lot to say about suffering for being a Christian. Peter is writing to suffering Christians, isn't he? They've dispersed from Jerusalem. And these Christians that this letter is being taken around to goes to five uh, different churches, which we now know as Turkey, and, and they're suffering a high price for being a Christian. Something most of us know very little about in this country. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't know about it and be ready for it. And um, the Christians that he's writing to, they meet in homes, they meet in caves, they meet in the woods. And they love Jesus, but life is really tough for them. It was about 250 years after the church was born to the time they began to meet in public buildings. And so God has already reminded them that they are a chosen people. And he says that to us, that this world is not our home Folks, we're going to have to get serious again about Jesus coming soon. I, I don't know, I, I guess because when I was a teenager, we sang soon and very soon all the time in church. And we talked about it all the time. And if Peter Jenkins was your minister, you heard lots and lots of sermons about it. And it was great. Um, and then we kind of seemed to have had a bit of a lull where we thought, well, he hasn't come yet, so we'll give it a break. You know what? Jesus is coming soon. And we need to be ready for him and we need to be eager for him to come. This world is not our home. Don't get too comfortable here. God is in control. We believe that, don't we? You know, when we talk about suffering in a minute or two, bear with me. But remember through it all that God is always in control. There is no panic in heaven when a Christian dies for, for the glory of God. There is no panic in heaven. Our obedience matters. We, we, I think we're getting the hang of that in this church now, aren't we? That obedience matters. And it matters as well. We don't mess, mess around with things that are going to harm us. Praise God here, folks have realised that we need to leave out things like Halloween. They are not good for us. They will hurt us and harm us. And they bring glory to the devil. Praise God. I think we're getting the hang of that in this house. We can have joy even through all the sorts of things we have to live through. God calls us to be holy. God calls us to love one another deeply. We're getting there. Thank you for those who supported Dee at the funeral. There was about 18 of us there. That was great, wasn't it? And we sang that song. Oh, with such gusto and glory. And worship God together. And I was able to share the gospel. Tell everyone there that they, that they, Jesus is just a prayer away. I'm praying for our brothers and for our son. We're, we're learning to love one another. Our identity is in Jesus. We need to submit to him. To keep doing good. And now Peter writes about suffering. He's not talking about general suffering. We've, we've, We've talked about that many times before. 
in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, Jesus says, because I've overcome the world. Remember, he's in control. Control. But now he's talking about suffering for being a Christian. So let's read chapter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you're insulted, the Bible says the Holy Spirit's resting on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any kind of criminal or even a meddler, busy body, gossip, any of that. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for the judgment to begin with God's household. And we've asked him to do that here, haven't we? We've said, we've said start with us, Lord. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? We'll leave it there for now. It's so important, as I've just said, we teach the whole of scripture. It's so important that you and I read our Bibles, not just the, the happy verses. It says in, in 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So yeah, it's good that we've said to each other, learn, learn the verses that, you, that can really help you, you know, in day-to-day in, in -day life. Learn the fact that I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me. That's important that we know that, but we need the whole of the scriptures. If you want to be mature, you've got to know it all. We know that suffering happened in the early church. They suffered greatly for their faith. I'll mention one or two of them and how, how they died. Um, Peter was martyred in Rome, 66 AD, during the persecution under Emperor Nero. Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified, we think, upside down at his request, since he did not feel worthy to die in the same manner as his Lord. Andrew went to the Soviet Union. Christians there claim him as, as the first to bring the gospel to their land. He preached to Asia Minor, to modern-day Turkey and in Greece, where he too, we believe, was crucified. Thomas... Um, preached in India and Syria and died, we believe, pierced through with spears of four soldiers. Philip, uh, he was put to death too. I've got a, a whole list here. I'm not going to read them all to you. Get the hang of it. Christians in the early church suffered for boldly preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. John is the only one of the company generally thought to have died a natural death at an old age. He was the leader of the church in Ephesus. We know that he ended up on the island of Patmos and he's credited there with writing the book of Revelation. I've always loved the story of Stephen. He's one of my favourite New Testament characters. And what I love is the fact that when he was being stoned, he wasn't saying, no, no. Don't do it. And there weren't people around him going, no, don't do it. Satan, get me. There was none of that. Do you know what, do you know what Stephen did? Let me just read to you these verses because I find them quite incredible. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious. Stephen was telling them about what God had done and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He saw the glory of God and he prayed, Lord, forgive them. Forgive these people. They don't know what they're doing. There was, guess what? No panic in heaven 
when Stephen died for his faith. When we look at more modern times, and it's only a really brief look at things because there are thousands of examples. The Salvation Army began in 1865 in the East End of London when they went onto the streets and told and sang about the love of God. People hated them and hurled all sorts of horrendous things, worse than bricks, at them. And um, that's why they started wearing hats and bonnets, to give themselves a bit of protection. Then I remember the story of Jim Elliot. Some of you know this story. Let me read a little bit about his life. On Tuesday, January the 3rd, 1956, Jim Elliot and four missionaries landed on a small strip of land in the jungles of Ecuador. It was a dangerous landing and they could not all land at once. For years they'd been dreaming and planning and praying for this moment. Their hearts were set on reaching the Alka Indians with the good news of Jesus. They were a dangerous tribe. No one had reached them before. Some had exchanged gifts, but people had always been attacked. For three months, the missionaries had been regularly flying over and dropping gifts and shouting greetings. And now here they were. They knew the dangers. Their wives had discussed the possibility that they might become widows. Elizabeth Elliot, the wife of Jim Elliot, says they went simply because they knew they belonged to God, their creator and their redeemer. They had no choice but to go and take the good news to every nation. On Friday, January the 6th, three Alcas, one man and two women approached them. They exchanged greetings. The missionaries showed their rubber bands, yo-yos, balloons. And they even took one of them up in a plane. On Sunday, the 8th of January, they were due to radio in at 4.30. There was silence. When no message came, a plane was sent and a rescue party went. Four of their bodies were recovered. All of them had been lanced to death. The fifth was never found. All five were martyred for the sake of Christ. All were married and were fathers. One wife was pregnant. Her three-year-old was heard and her mum said to her, never you mind, when you get to heaven, I'll show you which one is your daddy. Jim Elliot is famous for this quote. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And we know that the wives went back out there and, um, and there's a church there now because people boldly went where people didn't know about Jesus. Today, we, it's Italian, isn't it? We have trouble telling somebody down the shop that Jesus loves them. Today, we know that persecution for being a Christian still happens. Let me tell you what happens in North Korea. North Korean Christians are said to be the most persecuted in the world. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea is an atheistic state. According to one report, at least 200,000 Christians have gone missing since 1953. If you are found with a Bible, you will be killed along with your entire family and they'll kill the children first so you can watch it. On November the 17th, CBN News interviewed a man called Vernon Brewer, president of World Help. He smuggles Bibles into Korea. If they get caught with a Bible, he says it is a death sentence. Yet they are willing to risk their lives every day to get God's word into the hands of a North Korean Christian. They have never had a Bible. That's how precious it is to them. It's the good news. Wow. We take, what, don't we take our Bibles for granted, folks? Brewer believes of some 300,000 Christians that are there in Korea, at least 70,000 of them are currently in hospital because they've expressed a desire to practice the Christian faith. Much of the work we do, he says, is secret. 
But I can tell you this, we are distributing Bibles because it's the greatest need these people have. And we have a goal to distribute 100,000 as soon as possible. This was all on CBN News, I'm not making it up. And yet we live this side of the world where lots and lots of preachers would tell us, if you come to Jesus, you are promised wealth, health and happiness. Can I tell you this morning, it's just not true. He's not going to nest, he might, he might provide you with a car because he's a great provider and he is our provider. But it, it's not an automatic license to have all these things, you know. That's not our God. It's not what the scriptures say. Peter says, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you. We shouldn't be surprised when these things happen. As though something strange was happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. God is with us, folks, and he wants us to rejoice. It's tough because we, we like to be liked, don't we? I love to be liked. I like it when you tell me you like me. And I don't enjoy suffering. Neither do you. I wonder if Peter, when he wrote this, was thinking about the night that he ran from his suffering. Remember when Jesus was arrested and the servant girl came to him and said, you're, you're the guy who was hanging about with Jesus. And Peter denied Jesus three times because he was scared of suffering. And yet when he was filled with the Holy Spirit after the day of Pentecost, he ended up dying for his saviour. Peter reminds us too that suffering proves the genuineness of our faith. It's not to be regarded as something foreign to Christian, but rather a refining test as gold is extracted and refined by fire. So is our faith being refined by trials and suffering. Peter tells us to remember if we are insulted for Christ, don't be surprised. Don't think it's strange. It's not that you don't have any faith. Jesus said, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would, ah, oh, this is a bit testing, isn't it? If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own, as it is. You do not belong to the world. I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Right at the very end, I want to challenge you with something that was written on a, a, a site about this missionary. It's interesting, isn't it, that um, most of us seem to be fairly likeable to the world. And God would say, stand up for me anyway whatever happens. Romans 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentiles. We might suffer, folks, but I will remind you that we win. We're not on the losing team. There is no panic in heaven. Jesus has already paid the price and won the victory. This is just a short period before heaven when the devil has a little bit of time to do his thing. And he's, he's already lost. God says, keep enduring. T 2 Timothy says, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I'm suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal, Timothy says. But God's word is not chained. God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. He is a trustworthy saying, Timothy says. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, he we will also reign with him. God has called us, you and me, to serve Jesus with all of our hearts. Again, a little quote from Romans 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is, is, is to be revealed to us. Don't quit. 
God would say to you this morning. Whatever's happening in your life, don't quit. Continue to do good, Peter says. We are a blessed people, aren't we? We are a blessed people. God is with us. Is God with us? Will he ever leave us? Never leave us or forsake us. He's always working on our behalf in ways we can not see. And I just have a sense in this house, in these times, God is asking us for more of ourselves. God is asking us to get bolder, to get more passionate. Do you know what will happen along with that? Probably a little bit of suffering. So what are we going to do about it? We're going to rejoice that the Holy Spirit is on us. Let me read to you in conclusion this little passage I found that is from Jim Elliot, the missionary. Forgive me for being so ordinary while claiming to know such an extraordinary God. I, I, I can say this, Lord, forgive me for being so ordinary. We've already repented this morning. We are so utterly ordinary. Maybe, you, this may not be true for you. It's true for me. So commonplace. While we profess to know a power of the 20th century does not reckon with, but we are harmless and therefore unharmed. A lot of society treats us as harmless. We are no threat to them because we're not bold. We're sweet, aren't we? Sweet little Christian from down the road. We are spiritual pacifists, non-militants, conscientious object objectors in this battle to the death with principalities and powers in high places. Meekness must be had for contact with men, but brass outspoken boldness is required to take part in the comradeship of the cross. We are sideliners, coaching and criticising the real wrestlers while content to sit by and leave the enemies of God unchallenged. That's a terrible thought, isn't it? That we're leaving the enemies of God in these streets unchallenged. The world cannot hate us. We are too much like its own. Oh, that God would make us dangerous. Amen. There's some truth in that, isn't there? There's some truth in that. The world doesn't hate us because uh, we've not really, up to now, been a, an awful lot of threat to them. And God is taking, I think, God is taking this house somewhere very, very special. He's asking us to get passionate about him. He's asking us to be obedient so that he's calling us to do things we would never have known we could do before in his strength and for his glory. Those streets, we've heard about the streets of Nottingham last night. Streets have been taken over by evil and we are the people of God. We need to be dangerous. We need to get out there, folks. Yes, the Bible does speak about suffering. So I had to preach it today because it's in there. And I just pray that all of us together, as Helen said, let's do this together because we can watch each other's backs then, can't we? Let's just be bold and on fire for God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for all those who've gone before us. We thank you for the martyrs who have given their lives, Lord, because they went with the gospel to unreached parts of the world. We thank you, Lord, there's an unreached whole nation here of people who've never even been to Sunday school. Loads and loads of people who've never heard about you, Jesus. Oh, God, would you just empower us to go? Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Forgive us for being harmless. We want to be dangerous Christians. 
Would you help us, Lord, in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen.